Meta Gabbler is a powerful, tragic four-act play written by Henrik Ibsen and first performed in 1891. In Act 1, George Tessman and his wife Hedda, maiden name Gabbler, have just come back to Norway after a six-month vacation. They're visited by George's elderly aunt, Miss Juliana Tessman, who has raised George as her own child. Hedda, a general's daughter and a socialite, is uncomfortable around the bourgeois Miss Tessman and has difficulty treating her like family. The next visitor is Mrs. Elvsted, a former classmate of Hedda's who has fled her husband in order to be close to her lover and her children's tutor, Eilert Loveborg. Eilert is a historian like George and is George's main professional rival. Judge Brack drops by to see how the young couple is settling in. He brings further news about Eilert, who has surprised everyone by getting sober and publishing a successful new book. For George, this is bad news because it makes Eilert a serious contender for the professorship George was counting on. Judge Brack confirms George's worst suspicions by stating that the professorship will now be subject to an open competition among the candidates. Struggling to suppress his career and financial worries, George agrees to join Judge Brack at a party that evening. In Act 2, that afternoon, Judge Brack returns to collect George for the party. George isn't home, so he sits down and chats with Hedda, who's disillusioned with her marriage and faces her future with foreboding. George returns, changes into evening clothes, and tells Judge Brack he is expecting a visit from Eilert Loveborg. And Eilert shows up and somewhat sheepishly announces he's completed yet another book, which is even better than the recently published one. He has the manuscript with him and offers to read some to George. Learning that George and the judge are headed out for the evening, Eilert declines an invitation to join them and sits down with Hedda to look through some photos. Meanwhile, George and Judge Brack enjoy a glass of punch in an adjoining room. In the previous act, it was hinted that Eilert was an old flame of Hedda's. Well, this scene confirms his ongoing feelings for her. When Mrs. Elvsted arrives, Hedda sets about driving a wedge between her and Eilert. In what she pretends as a moment of careless honesty, Hedda lets slip that Mrs. Elvsted is worried Eilert will start drinking again, a revelation that offends Eilert. Vindictively, he pours himself two glasses of punch and downs them quickly, then announces he would like to go along to the party after all, and the three men leave. Mrs. Elvsted's trust in Hedda appears shaken. In Act 3, the next morning finds Hedda asleep on the couch and Mrs. Elvsted sitting up in an armchair. When Hedda awakens, she sends Mrs. Elvsted to bed, promising to let her know if she hears anything about Eilert. George comes in carrying Eilert's manuscript. It was misplaced during the night, and he intends to return it discreetly to avoid further embarrassment. Leaving the manuscript in Hedda's care, he then rushes off to attend to his Aunt Rena, who's ill and likely will pass away soon. Judge Brack pays a brief visit and tells Hedda all about Eilert's drunken escapades, which ended with a trip to the police station. Eilert, still reeling from his wild night out, arrives and Mrs. Elvsted quickly joins him on stage. He announces that Mrs. Elvsted must leave him before she becomes further entangled in scandal. When she resists, he adds that he has destroyed his manuscript, on which they had worked so diligently together. Notably, the symbol of vine leaves appears in this act. Repeatedly mentioned in the dialogue, the image of vine leaves captures the romance and idealism with which Hedda Gabler still views Eilert Loveborg, her former sweetheart. The symbol is a kind of highbrow inside joke between the two of them, since Eilert mentions that Hedda used to refer to vine leaves in his hair back when they were together. In those days, Eilert was a hard-drinking bohemian with a reputation for trouble. But Hedda remembers and reimagines him in mythological terms. The vine leaves are an allusion to Dionysus, Greek god of wine, or his Roman equivalent, Bacchus, both of whom were frequently depicted wearing crowns or wreaths of grapevines. Hedda doesn't glorify Eilert's drunkenness per se, but merely romanticizes its good qualities while overlooking its destructive potential. For Hedda, the sober version of Eilert is too timid, awkward, and tame. Once he gets a few drinks in him, she hopes, he will turn back into the flushed and fearless Eilert she knew before. As it happens, he does not return to the Tessman house with vine leaves in his hair, but ends his night of carousing in a police station. Here, in the night's fallout, Mrs. Elvsted is crushed by this revelation and leaves the house in a daze. Eilert then confesses he's lost the manuscript, and now, with his career, reputation, and romantic prospects in ruins, he sees no option but to kill himself. 
Hedda encourages him to make a brave end of it, even lending him one of her two pistols. After Eilert is gone, Hedda takes out his manuscript and throws it into the fire. In Act 4, Aunt Rena has died. George returns from the wake, still worried about Eilert and unsure of his whereabouts. Hedda privately reveals to George that she's burnt Eilert's manuscript, an act that fills him with a mixture of dread and gratitude. Mrs. Elvstead rushes into the house, concerned for Eilert, who is rumored to have been hospitalized. Judge Brack shows up and confirms the rumor. Eilert has shot himself and will die shortly. As a memorial to Eilert, Mrs. Elvstead decides to try to reconstruct his book from loose notes she kept, and George agrees to help. Readers will consider the journey of the main symbol of Eilert's manuscript, a critical symbol in the play that has different meanings for different characters at different times. For Eilert, the manuscript represents a triumphant return to society and serves as a promissory note for a brighter future. His previous book, though critically successful, is uncontroversial, bland, and concerned with the past, while this new manuscript deals with the future of civilization. This manuscript also represents Eilert's attachment to Mrs. Elvsted, who has spent months helping him assemble it. Mrs. Elvsted calls the manuscript their child. Hedda Gabler's decision to destroy the manuscript stems from her understanding that it's a symbol of Eilert and Mrs. Elvsted's union, and thus of the distance that separates Hedda from Eilert. In the final act of the play, George has a new chance of advancing his career as the editor of Eilert's writings. Hedda burning his book has not truly banished his ghost, which now threatens to haunt her own marriage as well. In a sense, George is becoming a foster parent to Eilert and Mrs. Elvsted's child. Another of Hedda's plans that backfires. While George and Mrs. Elvsted set about their work, Judge Brack reveals the truth of Eilert's condition to Hedda. He's already dead, and his death was evidently not a suicide. He says the gun, which he had seen before in Hedda's possession, must have been stolen. But as long as he keeps quiet, the police will not be able to trace the pistol back to Hedda. Realizing she now is at Judge Brack's mercy, Hedda quickly makes up her mind to end her own life, rather than live in fear of blackmail. She gets up, goes quietly to an inner room, and shoots herself in the temple. Rushing into the room, George and the rest are astonished to find Hedda dead. Pistols are clearly another main symbol in the play. Anton Chekhov once remarked that one must not put a loaded rifle on the stage if no one is thinking of firing it. Although she never physically threatens her husband with the guns, Hedda uses them to create psychological distance and perhaps to stir up some guilt over her husband's inability to provide her with the life she wants. Hedda's pistols are a constant presence in the play, whether brandished openly or merely mentioned in conversation. Before the play even begins, she has frightened Eilert Loveborg away by threatening to shoot him, a threat that the desperate Eilert now wishes she had carried out. The gun functions both as a deadly weapon and as a reminder of their tense but inspired past relationship. In the final moments of the play, by taking her own life, she spares herself from the inevitable fear and shame of being implicated in Eilert's death. Readers have likely picked up on the key themes of the play, still resonant over a century after its first performance. First is the boredom of the idle rich. One of the most startling things about Hedda Gabler's actions is that her manipulations are motivated largely by boredom. Hedda's world-weary attitude drives her to treat others with careless contempt. In fact, Hedda is unique among the play's major characters in her inability to derive any kind of real enjoyment from life. This could be a consequence of her role as a high society woman who lacks a vocation, or rather a woman who has rejected her assigned vocation as a wife and potential mother. Ultimately, Hedda's profound boredom leads to lazy thinking on her part, and other characters' actions, predictable enough to the audience, begin to catch her off guard. For example, Judge Brack is a source of cynical amusement to Hedda, maybe even a potential lover, but she's too diverted by his company to truly recognize the threat he possesses. Fixated on the chance for some excitement from her wealthy, detached life, Hedda discounts the very real possibility that Eilert will drink his way into a tawdry mess. Power and powerlessness is another main theme. In fact, another reason for Hedda Gabler's destructive and seemingly random behavior is her oppressive feeling of powerlessness. 
Throughout the play, Hedda grasps for power over others, not just on the grand scale of molding destinies, but on the more modest level of the individual conversations she has. Her cruel joke on Miss Juliana Tessman in Act 1 is a small but significant example. She has nothing to gain from making Miss Tessman self-conscious about her bonnet. For Hedda, Miss Tessman's feelings count for less than the feeling of being in control. Hedda derives a similar amusement from having Mrs. Elvsted at her mercy, and in her interactions with Judge Brack, Hedda seizes every opportunity to control the dynamic, even if it means firing a pistol in his direction or her own. In getting Eilert drunk after Mrs. Elvsted has spent years helping him get sober, Hedda asserts a crude and short-lived form of power over her former beau. Finally, sexism and liberation is a key theme. Hedda Gabler's feelings of boredom and powerlessness stem from the repressive social structures within which she's forced to live. Lacking the freedom to pursue a career or choose her own diversions, Hedda has little to look forward to in married life and feels suffocated. The women in Hedda Gabler respond to these societal constraints in various ways. Miss Juliana Tessman seems to have fully embraced the traditional feminine role of caregiver. Mrs. Elvsted courageously flees from her failing marriage. However, Hedda is still at the mercy of a culture in which men have much greater freedom than women, and in which some men, like Judge Brack, are entirely too glad to abuse this freedom. Hedda Gabler was not the only play in which Ibsen dramatized the plight of women in a sexist society. A Doll's House and Ghosts feature similar themes. From its debut, audiences were polarized by this controversial play. One 1891 critic said Hedda was an enigmatic, even fascinating character, full of seemingly contradictory traits. She obsessed over her trivialities while smiling at tragedies, and she thirsted for life, but was undone by her own cowardice. The play was similarly controversial when it arrived in England and the United States, but Hedda continues to fascinate audiences and directors alike to this very day.